Welcome back into the mental game where this week's guest is NFL punter Drew Chrisman. I'd be going to work out, you know, just doing the same routine, just putting the time in and just hoping for anything and then nothing would come. And you're just like, gosh, I mean, I feel like this is what, you know, God's telling me I'm, I'm supposed to be doing. And it's just not working out. Like, why am I not on a team? And in this episode, Drew talks about his football career, the ups and downs of getting to live out his dream in the NFL, playing for his hometown team and punting for the Bengals, but also the heartbreak of getting cut this past training camp. Plus, we talk about his high school and college playing days at both LaSalle and Ohio State, and then what he's going viral for now off the field, giving back to his community as a DoorDash driver, all of that and much, much more in this episode. But once again, if you're loving the mental game, please like subscribe rate review tell your family tell your friends as we try to help as many people as possible with their mental health but now it is time for the latest edition of the mental game with drew chrisman Welcome back into the mental game. As you can see, I got a very special guest sitting next to me, former LaSalle punter like myself, Ohio State punter and Bengals punter, Drew Crispin, also all pro door dasher. And we didn't even plan this. We both have Skyline shirts on. So uh, I don't know if this episode's coming out literally the day after we tape it, but Skyline needs to hit us up. I'm going to say, yeah, Skyline, <laughs> you see this, hit us up, man. We are open to anything. <laughs> You're on my mind right now, actually, so... That's so Coney's <laughs> would not hurt as well. No, Coney's always good. Drew, thanks so much for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, we've uh, known each other for a long time. Like I mentioned, both LaSalle punters. I like to joke that I kind of laid the groundwork. For sure. I mean, for I your- can't even remember in high school, you did an interview with me and we had, we had like a little punt off or kind yeah. of punt teach tape and maybe maybe I did pick up something you never know yeah. I don't know if I'd be sitting here today if we didn't have that exactly all right I'll take credit for that uh, also <laughs> was coach Heidorn your your punting coach he was the special teams coordinator yeah. I don't know necessarily like I would call it a punting coach yeah but, I mean he, he certainly told me to kick it further and higher and so that's kind of the main concept of what I do so in a way yeah yeah okay cool he was mine too so I saw him last week I thanked him for both of our careers there you go Um, we're gonna get into everything from from high school football like we just talked about but to Ohio State the Bengals the door dashing Uh, but I want to start with what I ask everyone is what does mental health mean to you and it's a complicated question you know it's something that you know people maybe answer because it's something that they you know realized early in their life they needed to take care of or maybe there was something traumatic that happened later on but I'll ask the same to you what does mental health mean to you yeah that is a great question I don't know if there's necessarily one perfect answer for it um but in a way that kind of what I think about it I didn't have I would say one specific situation in my health Mm -hmm. in my my life that happened where I realized how important mental health is but um, just kind of going through the sports career that I've had and seeing all the different guys in the locker room and yeah. different personalities and backgrounds. And you can really see the difference of the guys that are able to make it to that next level yeah. and the guys who aren't. And necessarily the physical level, talent-wise, isn't that big of a difference. The guys who achieve either college or even the pro level yeah, than the guys who kind of just walk away from it and kind of fall short of what their their dreams might have been. And it's not really the, the, the talent side. It's sometimes it's just between the ears and mm-hmm. what's going on, you know, the upbringing or, or at home and the guys who have all the kind of their X's, O's and lies and just allows them to perform as they can on the field. And um, if you have, if you have a foggy mind, if, if everything's coming at you all at once, I mean, it's just hard to really focus in on, on achieving that dream that you have. And um, yeah, there's just, it's, I've seen a lot of talent wasted by, by guys who just can't get it together really off the field or, um, between the ears. Um, I kind of joke sometimes there was even a, a coach in high school, I forget his name now, but he, he, I was, I, there's a, there's a phrase I always coined in my mind from him. It was million dollar body, but 10 cent brain. Um, yeah, I like it, as harsh as that sounds, it, it, it is true. If, if you, your, your brain is as valuable as your body, if you oh, want to yeah. get to this level. And, uh, so I, I think in a way that's what I think of when I think of mental health, you know, mental health 
is wealth. If you want to get to this level and achieve that dream that you have, you have to be a million dollar brain as well yeah. as a million dollar body. Well, where do you think that? Cause obviously you've been able to perform at a high level, getting a, a scholarship to play at the Ohio state university and punt there, making it to the NFL. Like, where do you think that was rooted for you that you did have that strong mental health and foundation? I mean, it, naturally it goes back to your, your family, how you were raised. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Lawrenceburg and then, uh, in a way I moved to the big city when I came <laughs> to LaSalle and yeah. kind of had a fresh start from there. And, um, you know, it was driving a half hour away. All of, all the people I grew up with and everything, it was a whole new slate and mm -hmm. I really got to, I guess a fresh start and just kind of got to be my own person away from, you know, just, uh, the small little bubble that I grew up in. And, um, I was fortunate I got into a great school, you know, mm -hmm. LaSalle and, and having the educators and all the lessons and values and the principles that they, that I've learned. And, you know, you know, as well, yeah. going to the same <laughs> high school. So yeah. I, I give a lot of credit to them. And then that carried on to, um, Columbus and, and just enhancing those principles that I learned at, at LaSalle and the, you know, the pillars of faith as well, which has always been uh, very strong in, in my life where um, I actually converted right before going into high school as well, talking yeah. about a fresh start um, from Catholicism to we'll call it LDS, but more, more common term is Mormonism. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, my now wife's, uh, they had a big part in that. And yep. so being close to, you know, my family and then we all convert into you know, a faith that we're very active in. And so that has been just as strong as a base as I could ask for. And yeah. obviously I've just been able to grow from that. So going from like Lawrenceburg to the big city of, of Cincinnati and going to the West side over to LaSalle, was that like, was that a hard adjustment as a 14 year old? Uh, yes and no. Um, I think because of sports, you yeah. know, you're naturally you're kind of thrown into the same kind of situation you get used to growing up, you know, the locker room brotherhood in a way. Yep. Um, that, you know, that's similar in a lot of different, uh, situations. So having, you know, the football team and guys that I know, you know, immediately coming to, to school, yeah. already having like a, a friend group as well. I right. think that's a lot of the times you see where people come from, you know, out of town or transfer schools. They, they don't quite necessarily have a, a group, yeah. you know, to kind of fit into. Luckily I had sports to kind of, already make an immediate friendship with guys before the school, you know, even started just going to workouts and, you know, summer practices and whatnot before yeah. actually even walking in day one of school where you're literally like, who am I going to sit with at lunch? I've already got, you know, in a way like 60 friends before right. this day one starts. So, you know, I'm fortunate to have the, uh, the sports, but it, 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 it was different. I mean, it was, it was a lot different than, you know, how Lawrenceburg worked and just, the, you know, the West side and those guys have been going to school, you know, all, I trust me the, the <laughs> I learned more about their grade schools and their St. James and St. Exactly and more yeah. than anything I would have uh, imagined um, going into high school and it, it was cool to see that and obviously I missed that but I I, was, I had four great years at LaSalle and friends that I still talk to today so yeah and I'm still the same way with the guys that I went to high school with um so sports that being like you kind of mentioned the the centerpiece for you moving into a new high school and a new area just to you know get a great start and obviously you started there and were a big time recruit being a punter but was what was your like was kicking professionally a dream growing up or where did where did that start for you no no not, not in the slightest honestly um my goal was to be a quarterback okay um, and that was a little different that was my love yeah yeah do using my arm more than my my leg and so that was my my goal going into high school um you know, it didn't necessarily work out that way. I was kind of comp competition with Nick Watson. I don't know if yep. you remember that name. Mm -hmm. um, he went on to be the, the starting varsity guy. And then I was on JV as the quarterback. And then um, we were playing Moeller one year. And I reached out for a fumble. And I had to get Tommy John surgery when the guy landed on it and tore that Jeez. same tendon as a, like a baseball player would. Yeah. So throughout rehab, um, I kind of wasn't able to throw, but I was able to kick still. They let me kick throughout the rest of the year. I was kicking on varsity, punting on varsity, not knowing anything about it. And yeah. I just, I just had a good leg and was the more, cons I just was more consistent than anybody else on the team and, um, never really put too much thought into it. But since I couldn't throw anymore, I was like, well, I might as well do everything I can for the team. Right. So yeah. 
look up some YouTube uh, videos, <laughs> and there was a guy named Ray Guy. You remember familiar with yeah. that name? He's kind of a only punter in the Hall of Fame. So he had like a little, I guess, just quick hits on how to punt. I I watched I watched a couple of those videos and started turning a couple balls over. Like, hey, I got yeah. I might have something here, and um, I really never went back back to quarterback. And, you know, one door closed and. I saw a whole new path um, when when that one closed, and and I I really felt like it was it was God's plan. Like I, yep. I, honestly, I would not be sitting here today if I still was playing quarterback. I yeah. would have probably gone to like Mount St. Joe or maybe some odd oddball D three, and that would have been the end of my career. So I think in a way, you know, God was really looking out for me and and showing me like, all right, we're gonna start using your leg now to uh, yeah. progress your career. <laughs> I just I didn't even know you could get a scholarship as a punter either. That's yeah, how that's yeah. how ignorant I was in just the whole football landscape. But uh, I know more about punting than I'm, I ever thought I would. So. Well, that's how I feel with, you know, the sports reporting career for me. I have all that stuff that happens with my mental health. And yeah. I, I leave that job. I never would have thought a year and a half ago I'd be doing what I'm doing now. For sure. But I'm so thankful. Like I said, I think God has a plan to, or like you said, like God has a plan to kind of move you and shift you. And it just feels like the purpose for me. And so for you, it worked out perfectly um when did you start getting getting calls getting letters realizing that hey i might be able to do something with right. this leg yeah as i mentioned like i didn't know you could even go play college as a punter like i did <laughs> not think i did not like we never watched football growing up really we didn't have cable in my house oh so, wow yeah i mean it was we were outdoors i mean we never really sat down and watched the tv um i enjoyed playing the sports when i did watching it so yeah um, I didn't even know who Urban Meyer was when he, I first originally got that call. As I know, it's, it, it sounds crazy. <laughs> Actually, funny story, I think we were playing X one year, and he came and watched, I think it might have been Derek Keefe or something like that. Yeah, probably. Um, I, he was committed to Alabama. I think they were trying to cr recruit him as well. And uh, Nate Moore was a head coach at the time. He huddled us up before the game. It was kind of weird. He never does that. And he just said, hey, I just want you guys to know, Urban Meyer is going to be on the sideline. In case you guys see him, I don't want you to freak out. <laughs> And I, I, I tapped my buddy uh, Vince Abney on the side. He was a big Ohio State fan, which I learned yeah. after, after this whole process. I tapped him like, who's Urban Meyer? <laughs> and he's like, you're joking. Lo and behold, a year later, all of a sudden, I'm standing in his office, and he's offered me a, a full-ride scholarship. So it's just funny how that, <laughs> that worked out. But uh, gosh, I even forget the question now. Uh, uh, how do you even get it? Like, isn't it? like, how do you even get a scholarship? To, yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is, it is question uh like i mentioned I, I started kind of down the path of a punter after i got hurt from quarterback went to a couple kicking camps uh i found a coach locally um who had worked with the ohio state kicker at the time yeah uh, sean nurnberger so um in a way there was a little bit of a columbus connection there and uh gosh yeah i just i just really fell in love with it um yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, if you remember back as when you were a punter, you just it's just the most satisfying feeling in the world when you can hit that that clean, perfect spiral that you just know immediately after your foot and you just strive for that every time. It doesn't happen every time. Yeah, it honestly is one of the more frustrating things I've ever imagined. Uh, you know, there's a lot of parallels to golf. Yes, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> you hit like a clean golf shot and in and, and golf, you're like, oh, I'm the best ever. I'm never going to miss again. And then all yeah. of a sudden you shrink one in the woods the next and you're, you know, looking for balls more than on the uh, on the fairway the rest <laughs> of the round. So uh, so it is it is it is a frustrating, uh, you know, sport because I mean, it's just so much detail yep. and you're off by that much. Um, you know, I mean, it's just ultimate focus you got to have. But I fell in love with that feeling and, and just chased it and just and just refined that skill. And ultimately, I wound up at one of the best, you know, colleges in, in, in the country, so close to home, too. Um, and, yeah, it, it worked out. Like I said, I would not be sitting here today if I was still chasing that quarterback dream. Well, I have to go back to you not knowing who Urban Meyer was. Uh, did you ever tell him that? Uh, I did not. <laughs> no, uh, honestly, I didn't have too many conversations with Urban my entire time knowing him. Um, he he wasn't as much of a Ryan Day, you know, replaced him the last half of my career there in Ohio okay. State. Very different dynamic. Um, you know, Urban, Urban, he kind of motivated through fear in a way. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you'd be just be scared to just walk through the hallways of, you know, the Ohio, Ohio State. Uh, just kind of how he. 
he ran the whole program, which was fine. Some people thrived on it. I felt like I thrived on it, but uh, he's not really the kind of guy you go sit down and just go walk in his office and have a you know conversation with. I don't think he would have been opposed to it, but just didn't seem the most comfortable of yeah. situations I wanted to put myself in. So I can really count on like probably two hands on how many conversations <laughs> I had with the guy my entire time knowing him. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was a great guy, an amazing coach. Uh, but no, I never ended up telling him that story, but he would probably get a chuckle out of it if he did. Hear All right. About it. Well, I, I hope he's on, on this guest list at some point. There you go. And yeah, I can, you could, you could definitely make it on here. Yeah. And I can, I can share that, uh, with him, but thankfully, you know, he offered you, you get to go to Ohio state and you get to experience, um, so, some really great years there. You fine tune your craft and you become one of the best punters in the country, which obviously gives you a chance to take it to the next level and make it to the NFL and you get to do it in your hometown and play for the Bengals. Obviously, um, you know, recently you're cut and you're, you're, it's a heartbreaking feeling, I'm sure, and we can get into that. But I want to ask about getting to live that dream first, though, especially for, you know, I know you said you didn't watch a lot of sports growing up, but were you a Bengals fan oh, at all? Okay. We, we went to Bengals games. Okay. Uh, we didn't watch too much of it on TV. Most of the time it was local blackouts. Yeah. You couldn't even watch it uh, on Unless TV. Unless Chad Johnson bought the tickets out. <laughs> exactly. Um, so... I, you know, if, if there was ever a team I was a fan of, I would I would have said the Bengals growing up. I uh, have lots of fond memories going to games with my dads, for sure. With my dad, not dads. But, uh, yeah, I love the Bengals. So you getting the chance to, to play for them in the first year, obviously you come in under Kevin Huber, yeah. who, like you, is a Cincinnati guy through and through or an Ohio guy like you through and through. And getting the chance to learn under him and play for your hometown team and kind of take over the duties after him what was that whole experience did you have to pinch oh, yourself through that i mean for sure i must i mean it was you know looking back on it it, it seems like it happened so fluidly uh, yeah but just the whole process of getting there it, it's a roller coaster and I, I have learned that throughout the, all the experiences of you know the nfl and just how different it is than mm -hmm. college i mean um you know college you sign a scholarship and you're pretty much guaranteed you know four years there it does not work that way in the NFL. Yeah. Um, I, I chose. I wasn't drafted. I was undrafted. Um, so I got to choose between a couple of teams after the draft had ended uh, where I ultimately wanted to go and try to compete for a roster spot. And as soon as the Bengals opened up, I was like, it's a no-brainer. I mean, yeah. it's right close to home. I was At the time, I was staying in my parents' basement at the time, saving on <laughs> saving on rent right after college. We didn't have a place yet, my wife and I. And yeah. uh, So I was commuting from Larsburg into Cincinnati. just felt like I was back in high school. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you know, the first year, it didn't work out necessarily. I actually had an injury. I broke my pinky in training camp, so I yeah. uh, missed out on a lot of the time to compete. And But luckily, the Bengals liked me enough to keep me around, and I got another, another chance the following year and, and took over uh, halfway through last year. And, I mean, shoot, yeah, just walking out there. I remember the first time, you know, getting the getting the uh, roster promotion to, like, the game day roster. I mean, I, I remember I called my dad, and he just was like – I know he wasn't – he tried to act cool, but he told me after he got off the phone, he's like, yeah, I just broke down. I just broke down and cried. And uh, so it was, it was very special for myself, but, you know, my family as well. Um, and it, it was an amazing second half of the year there and just all the experiences and, you know, literally everybody, everybody I grew up with, you know, here in Lawrenceburg and, and Cincinnati, I, I totally felt the support and, and love and ultimately we didn't get the job done. Uh, but I know that they have a phenomenal roster there soon and, and, and hope for many, many more successful seasons in the, the Who Day Nation. For you, like you mentioned the first time you walked out there, you could feel it a little bit. You know, people say whether they're a, a musician or an athlete, they don't get nervous anymore, there's no pressure. There had to be a little bit when you walk out there the first time. Yeah, I mean, when, you're, when you originally walk out there for, like, game day warm-ups, um, by the time the game starts or at least, you know, you get your first punt, you know, you got there for your first punt, most of the time it's like you're in the game at that point. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, you know, the build-up to the game, you know, leading up to it, um the, even the week of you know you you every day just gets you just feel like oh my gosh this is actually gonna happen mm -hmm. and then once you get out there you get that first punt under your belt or first play after that you're, you're kind of into the game after that football's football yeah yeah know? um but i i think there was certainly that first game there were there was some special meaning behind it just because of all the work that i knew that i had put in and just how much you know, I, I, I'd love the Bengals growing up mm -hmm. and, you know, wanted to be a part of this organization. So, um, 
yeah, I, I would be lying if after the game I didn't have some reflection on just like what, what just happened on like the plane. It was in Pittsburgh, my right. first game was, and just on the plane ride home, just li- yeah, literally having to pinch myself, just kind of reflecting on like what I had just done and, and yeah. you know, the process it took to get here. Well, I can say as somebody that's known you since you were in high school, I was proud. It was so cool. I was kind of part of that community and I was a sports board at the time covering that team. And so it's like just crazy seeing all that hard work pay off. And then, you know, I'm a hometown kid. I like doing stuff in Cincinnati. You get to live out your, your biggest dream possible playing in the NFL for your hometown team. Um, you mentioned the word roller coaster. How have you been able to handle the roller coaster of emotions between making the roster in the NFL for the Bengals and being the Bengals punter to seeing them draft somebody else, going through a competition, and then getting cut in camp? I mean, that is the definition of a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even looking back to my first year as a rookie, um, when I was often on the practice squad, I think I was cut, I think it was six times Jeez. my first year. Yeah. Um, now, I understood I understood the business of it a little bit. You know, they'd explain like, hey, there's a spot open next week. You know, we'll bring you back. Um, but it was there was no guarantee. Yeah, you know, I'd be sitting there on Tuesday. Tuesday was the day that we either get a, you know, a call, either we're getting cut, or we're going to get, you know, brought back to the roster or practice squad yeah. in some fashion. So there were some very long Tuesdays throughout that year. Yeah. And uh, just hoping some, – some weeks hoping the, the phone rang and the some weeks hoping the phone didn't ring. You know, right. hoping that you didn't get cut that week. Um, so it was – yeah, it was an adjustment from college. Just, you know, how, how safe of a situation I felt like I was in in Columbus until mm-hmm. – and then you just get thrown into – really you the business you know yeah. it, it really feels like it's a business and at this point now I really understand that you know getting cut for now my seventh or eighth time um I've been through it you know and this is typical how you know an undrafted p- player goes most of the time it doesn't work out you know as as Joe Burrow getting drafted first overall all of a sudden you're you're you know signing this highest paid contract you see that but for every one of those guys there's 10 of the guys who are you know just scratching and crawling for anything yeah um and every single week there's a whole new cycle of workouts and guys get new opportunities that you might not even know about yeah um and and especially in the in the specialist world i mean it's just it really is just a a merry-go-round of just just hoping for the right opportunity and hoping it sticks you can stay there as long as possible Mm -hmm. and if it doesn't work out there then you know there's another team that you might be able to fit a piece into it might be a better situation right so that's kind of the situation I am now and, um, you know, understanding the business side of it has helped me, you know, at least understand uh, that and kind of make more sense of it than if this would have been happening as like a rookie. Right. Um, and it, it, was a, it would have been a lot more, a lot harder to process, I would say. How do you not fall into a depression or a sadness when you get to achieve your dream, you do it in this dream situation of playing for your hometown Bengals team? And then within a few months, you're jobless. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you not fall into a depression when it comes to mental health? Kind of going back to what I said immensely uh, at the beginning about just, you know, the, the support that I have, the family that I live so close to. Yeah. Literally, you know, I married my next door neighbor. <laughs> I mean, so I've got as much family as I could ask for literally right, right here in the backyard. You know, I've got, I've got my, I've got a wife and I've got a 14 year old daughter now, you know, 14 yeah. month old. Daughter. 14, yeah. Did I say year? Yeah, <laughs> yeah 14, 14 months. Yeah. Trust me. I don't want 14 year yet. We're not. I am not nearly ready for <laughs> the like, teenage. I think year. I heard that one wrong. I'm not ready for the uh, danger teenage years. Yeah, we, we're barely managing the 14 months. But uh, <laughs> so having that, you know, going home every day, seeing their their, you know, their smiles and, and their faces. I mean, that certainly helps push through anything. But it is hard. Um, but that, I, like I said, I I understand the business at this mm-hmm. point. You know, I've been through it so many times. And uh, it's a roller coaster and, you know, the NFL, not for long. Yeah. And, you, know, you just got to enjoy it while you're in it. And uh, honestly, recently, if you've been following my social media a lot, I've gotten back to uh, some content creation that I've really enjoyed in the past. Yeah. And in a way, I, I know you, you promote therapy a lot. In a way, that's kind of been my own little therapy. Um, you know, in high school, I did some trick shot videos with my, my buddy Vite, or the kicker, mm-hmm. and we had some fun doing that. And in college, it was uh, – Bottle flipping, yeah, you know, doing you some need to drink some of that water. Well. I was to get gonna it say this right is a little fool. Yeah, maybe later on in the interview I'll be able to get yeah. it down. <laughs> uh, and now I've just been doing a little bit of DoorDash and getting around town and making some videos as well. So that's always kind of been a kind of a stress reliever of mine. And uh, 
I think in my position, you know, it's, 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 it really is like 10% physical, but like 90% mental mm -hmm. as a specialist. I mean, uh, as far as what we can do, if, if you can get it right between the years, you can go out there and execute. Um, and so being able to kind of having that off the field kind of stress reliever has always been a huge, you know, benefit. And yeah. it's always been some kind of, you know, creative outlet for me to, uh, relieve whatever the stress of it of the situation that I'm dealing with at football and obviously it's a game I yeah. get it um, you know some people when I say I'm stressed about punting or whatever the situation is they might laugh but it, um, you know it, it, that's all I kind of know you know yeah. that's that's what I've dedicated my life to so you know you have a bad day at practice sometimes you just you need a little bit of a a stress reliever and it's it's kind of been making videos as always and helping and giving back people as well i think that's that's certainly something i've always enjoyed doing as 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 selfishly kind of well, i'm helping people and, and they're kind of helping me at the same time yeah well you said it beautifully there i was going to ask you because you mentioned the word therapy the door dashing the the making the videos the being able to help somebody else that feels like therapy for you but it's also therapy for them how, how much fun has that been it has been an incredible amount of fun and and I, I've kind of been missing that creative outlet in the last couple of years I've just been so focused on you know breaking through the roster you know playing for the hometown team achieving that you know that childhood dream mm -hmm. and uh, while it's worked out you know I got to I got to live out that dream last year in the last couple of years and who knows what the future has in store for me yeah. um, but uh, I've kind of put that stuff on the back burner you know, I've just been so just pigeonholed in, into achieving that goal that, you know, I've kind of lost a little bit of that myself that I, I missed. And so going back and doing that this past off season I, has really brought back a little bit of the, the, the former spark that even my wife had noticed. Like, you know, it just seems a more, just more happy, like more complete as, as Drew that she knew yeah. while growing up or in college and whatnot. So um, it's been nice to kind of go back to the, you know, some some fun things I used to do uh, while I was in, in college and and kind of remember my my former self a little bit and it's just I've just been so much so much happier from doing it well you showed up to today's interview on your bike with a DoorDash bag <laughs> why door dashing uh, like I said God just has a way of, of working things out um, you know like I said I've been doing trick shots or bottle flipping up to this point and uh, I just kind of saw something one day uh, across my for you page it showed me a guy on his bike riding around and it just seemed like it just seemed to click I was mm -hmm. like that seemed like a lot of fun uh, it's great exercise which is something that at this level you can never have enough of right um, you get to see the city from another perspective um, get to interact with you know just the fan base in general or just the people around town which is something I feel like I'd hadn't been able to do as much because I come in from Lawrenceburg and I right. go right back home. Now I go right back home after practice to Lawrenceburg. So haven't really got to, you know, see the city um, as much as I would have liked to. So that was a check that box. And, um, and I don't know, it's just, it's just been a lot of fun. I mean, every single delivery is like a new, new story yeah. in a way. It, it, it is, it is, it's interesting the things you'll see on, on, on a daily basis. Even just today, uh, a couple of deliveries I did before I came here. There's, uh, there's no shores of interesting things happening in downtown Cincinnati on a daily basis. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, just getting outside and um, just been having a lot of fun with it. I, I, don't, I don't know why exactly it came to me. It just, it just did. Well, you're having so much fun doing it, and in the content is really really powerful you know i want to bring people together and help people when it comes to mental health with this show but some of the the videos that you put out have been super powerful i remember you i can't remember what you delivered or what she delivered but you gave her i think a hundred dollar tip and it went kind of viral then um moments like that do those stick out are there other ones and, and how special are experiencing those things yeah i mean anytime you can get out and meet someone or, or kind of break up their daily routine of someone else and just kind of catch them by surprise. I think, um, those are the moments that I enjoy the most. Yeah. Um, you know, just, you just never, never know how someone's day is going. Doesn't necessarily mean you're looking for, you know, someone panhandling on the street and you never know what someone's going through. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, it could be a guy walking into a skyscraper wearing a shoot and tie. He could be, you know, t just having a, a terrible day and just surprising him with some, 
free meal or, or just kind gesture or smile. Yep. I mean, it completely could impact the way the rest of their day goes and they might, you know, pass that forward on to someone else and just kind of create this ripple effect of, um, you know, just changing the character of someone. So yeah, the, I mean, those moments where you can impact someone that didn't know it was coming. Um, and especially doing the DoorDash, understanding you mentioned the, the hundred dollar tip I gave, we live off the tips, uh, the, you know, yeah. the DoorDash, the, you know, the gig economy, the drivers do. So, um, I guarantee you that was the biggest tip she'd probably, it certainly got that day probably in the whole career. So whatever she got going on the rest of the day, I know that it, it impacted her day going forward. Yeah, that was awesome. And I can speak to this cause I just recently started talking about it, but I, I drive Uber Okay. <laughs> and I like, I don't necessarily love doing it it's just kind of you know where i'm at running my own show yeah. and it, i'm a people person so but it is funny because probably not as much as you but i do get like i don't know what percentage of it probably 30 40 percent of people do recognize me whether it's right when they get in or at some point during the ride people wow. are like god you look familiar and i'm like yeah i don't know why that's crazy and then like <laughs> someone in the back figures it out but i was kind of like I don't know if ashamed about it at first was the right way to put it, but I didn't, yeah, I mean, I guess I was, I didn't like doing it because people see you on social media or see you doing this and they don't understand, you know, what you're going through, but you're like, you're right. Tips, they do make, oh, yeah. they do make a big, big difference. difference, but also being able to connect with people. I mm. think for me, that's been the most fun I've had driving Uber is having those conversations. And for me, because I do a mental health podcast, people feel compelled to talk about what they're going through. Now people see you on Instagram and TikTok, and it has become a very personable experience. How much, how meaningful is it to have impactful conversations more than just, hey, how are you? Or give somebody your meal. You're actually like, you're kind of doing what I'm doing, having those conversations too. <laughs> I would love to get you as my Uber driver. That'd be, that'd be <laughs> awesome. Um, but no, I would definitely say that's, that's, that's certainly one of the biggest benefits of doing this whole thing is just having be able to meet someone and, and have a conversation with, um, you know, someone that has a completely different background than myself and gain a whole new perspective yeah. of just what life looks like. And so that is, that is certainly something that I don't take for granted when I'm doing these deliveries or having a conversation with someone just on the side of the road or someone working in Chipotle or, mm -hmm. or some restaurant. So, uh, that's certainly a side to it side of it that, uh, is interesting and I would not have gotten those experiences and you know my daily routine of what I was doing before it's just it's just such a different you know different world that I yeah. lived in that sometimes you forget you know what reality is in a way yeah. and so it has been a way to kind of you know ground myself and, and and see and just gain a new perspective for you the goal is to one day be back in the league and be able to punt and live out that dream um but you're, you seem genuinely like happy, which is like for somebody that, and I hate saying it like this, but I worked in the sports business for, you know, 10 years where you see people on the, on the best and the worst days. And by definition, you should be in some of your worst days after getting cut. And like, just, it's really powerful to see how you feel, how you speak and that you are genuinely enjoying life and what you're doing. Um, how do you manage these next couple months? Because like you said, the episode comes out on a Tuesday. So those are Tuesdays when you can get some there calls. Um, how do you manage like living life, having fun, taking care of the family, but also working towards that goal and all, but not like making that the ultimatum end all be all for your happiness. What do these next couple of months look like for you? Right. No, I mean, if you would ask me that question a couple of years ago when I was a rookie getting cut every other week, I was a different, it was a different headspace than what I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, go going through that experience in that, knowing we don't want to live and die by the phone call on every Tuesday. Um, you know, we, in a way we've kind of started putting our eggs in, in more than just one basket. Right. I think that has helped me a lot mentally. Um, even just the other day after the, uh, the Bengals game, um, I was on spectrum news one. I started a little bit of a sports analysis, uh, gig. They uh, reached out to me. So I've been nice. doing a little bit of post game reporting, um, seeing what that stealing my job is huh? that, I'm literally <laughs> coming for your job. I, we might, we might as well switch. Yeah, right exactly. Now. So, um, yeah, I've just started kind of putting my hands in different pots and seeing what sticks and what else in life there is, um, out there for me. And, um, you know, I just, that feeling of waiting for that call every Tuesday. I don't want to, I don't want to go through that again. Yeah. Um, so we're going to see, um, obviously, you know, we're still training. Hopefully if a call comes, it comes, um, 
but I think, you know, at, 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 at this point with, you know, my family having a 14 month old now, um, I'm excited for, you know, what the, what the rest of life has. And hopefully I, I get a call this Tuesday and I play another 10 years, um, somewhere else down. But if that doesn't happen, um, I think, I think, um, there's a lot of, a lot of exciting things that I have coming in the future. You mentioned your family and the support of them helping you get through the ups and downs of football and life. I want to talk to you about your wife and daughter because you mentioned it before. You married your neighbor, yep. which I feel like is, is maybe a little rare, but in <laughs> Lawrenceburg, I could see it because you guys are growing up like you're growing up next to each other. It's a small knit community. Yeah. Um, but you get to experience some really, some really great years together throughout high school, college, growing up, I'm sure, and, and now here. How, how much has, has her partnership with you been a key to, to your success and that mental health that you have now? Yeah. I say I married my neighbor, but it was, it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> um, trust me, I was uh, very deep in the friend zone Yeah, <laughs> uh, for a long, long time. It wasn't until I mentioned we converted to uh, Mormonism. It wasn't until she had gone on her mission. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty typical thing we do in our, our faith. Guys go for two years, go, girls go for a year and a half. Yeah. She went to Arequipa, Peru, and it was every Monday for a year and a half. I had one hour to uh, email her. And that was kind of when I swooned over her heart, kind of got out of the friend zone wow. to the end zone, you know, I like to say. <laughs> but uh, after that, she came back, she transferred to Ohio State, and uh, we had a pretty viral uh, proposal on yep. the field there. And luckily she said yes. We got married, and everything's been smooth since. But tell you what, I, she blossomed a lot earlier than I did. I was just a tall pencil neck kind of dorky looking guy and <laughs> she had all the boys chasing after her so I just had to wait my time put in my time and eventually it worked out um but yeah that that relationship has been so vital you know just yeah just helping me throughout this whole process and she's been so supportive um you know like her and her whole family as well having them close and my family it's been um without without that being on my own somewhere, somewhere foreign, going through this whole process, I don't know if I could have done it. Honestly, yeah. it's been it's been a roller coaster. But having someone in the seat next to me on that roller coaster, it's been completely game changer. Well, you can see I, I've obviously known you for a long time, but seeing you guys out, I think of Sam Hubbard's um, foaling tournament. Yep. Got to see you guys together, and you can tell that there is that that big connection. And having that rock to help you through those moments is huge. Uh, if I can circle back for just a second, you mentioned your rookie year when you mm -hmm. got cut five, six, seven times. You don't know if you'd be able to have this same perspective. Were there dark nights, dark days when you were getting cut every two or three weeks? And how did you navigate, you know, that sadness? Would you say you suffered from any type of anxiety, depression during that season? I would in a small, I would say in a small amount. Yeah, just going back to, you know, thinking everything was going to be like college where it's just so guaranteed one week to the next um yeah I mean there was there were sometimes I'd get cut and then I wouldn't the phone wouldn't ring for a month and I'd be going to work out you know just doing the same routine just putting the time in and just hoping for anything and then nothing would come and you're just like gosh I mean I feel like this is what you know God's telling me I'm, I'm supposed to be doing and it's just not working out like why am I right. not on a team somewhere why am I not you know at least stick it on the practice squad for more than a week at a time yeah um and I mean, it, it got to the point sometimes where I just would lose some some morning's motivation to get up and go lift. I'm like, yeah, is this even worth it? Is this going to put the time in? And so I, I'd say some weeks of that that season, I've spent less time working out and maybe more time on the the couch playing video games, just hoping that waiting for the time to go by until Tuesday the next week, hoping to get a call. And um, so that was it. It was interesting. It was an interesting process, but I think. From that, um, having that perspective it, in a way has, has made me stronger from it, coming through that. And then even last year, um, you know, waiting, going through an entire preseason training camp and actually getting a, a chance to compete yeah. and then not getting the job when I, you know, I felt like I had, I had done enough to earn a job there. And um, luckily, again, the Bengals liked me enough to keep me on the practice squad. But even that felt like a little bit of a – you know, shots of the morale and I, and I felt like I'd put enough work in and, and had earned, you know, the right to be, you know, the, the guy at that time. But 
again, God had a plan and, and he just, just had needed me to be patient. Mm -hmm. And so I was patient through it and, and, and trusted that process. And, and luckily it worked out. Um, but I don't know if I would have had that same patience if I wasn't, you know, in the situation I was with, you know, the family and the support that I had around me, I could have, could have very easily just got up and like, screw this. This isn't working out. I'm, 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 I'm washing my hands with this and yeah. moving on to the next thing. Um, but yeah, having that support, it helped me stick through some of those, those darker, um, uneasy weeks that the calls didn't come. Yeah, no, and it's something that's that's crazy to me in sports, and fans don't see it outside of maybe like the hard knocks episodes, which I think they shouldn't be showing of, of guys getting cut. It's just, it sucks watching, but it's part of the business, or, yeah. or you know, people getting cut, like like you were talking about. Um, I give you all the credit in the world for for having that mindset because there are people, and you know, not just in football, but in life. You know, I went through it with my stuff of, you know, just drowning sorrows away with drinking and. and and going down the, the the depression and the anxiety and the suicidal thoughts and it's just things can spiral quickly and you see it a lot in sports because there's the high pressure week after week or year after year of getting signed or or, or getting cut or you know trying to find a find a home to play in um so i'm really happy for you and usually i'm like filled with questions but you you mentioned you being a, an anchor now or a, a host <laughs> yourself um and you do a lot of content on your own um, I'll kind of open it up. Like, if there's anything else you want to, you know, kind of touch on that I missed or questions for me, I don't know. That's I mean, I, I, I just want to get tip my hat to you. I mean, I know you're doing a lot of great work and this is helping a lot of people. And I've certainly watched your content since you've started creating this and going down this whole new adventure. And, um, you know, anytime I see a video, I always gain some new perspective or some little nugget of it that I might not have got going forward. So, no, no real questions, but just, you know, hats off to you. And I hope this is a very successful adventure because I know you're helping a lot of people. So, well, thanks. I didn't pay you anything for that, for that answer. <laughs> just Skyline did. Yeah, Skyline did. Well, I was going to ask. So, uh, go to Skyline order. Oh, uh, actually I ate it the other day. I made a video about it. It's uh, four away with onions and three cheese conies, Sheesh. but pro move. Don't get cheese on the conies. Just get a regular coney. They give you plenty of cheese on the four weight. Take some of the cheese off the four way, put it on the coney, and that's plenty of cheese that you'll need for your your whole meal there. Um, and I, I think that's it. Yeah, just some water. So. See, I'm obsessed with cheese. Now I didn't know when I went to like Chipotle or anywhere else, and I'm like, why do I get like 30 times more cheese than anyone else? It's because I grew up on Skyline. There like, you go. Um, I do three cheese, th three cheese conies, but that's the lingo in the in the restaurant three yeah. cheese three cheese conies no mustard with onion i'm weird don't like mustard so side of sour cream put sour cream on the conies. Yeah. never never done that a little hot I'll, sauce I'll try that definitely the hot sauce yeah oh yeah oyster crackers with hot sauce i you gotta have, you gotta start it off with that yeah skyline's got a sense of check since we're both wearing shirts and we started giving out giving out our orders if here not we might be in gold star next week so, <laughs> you know, whoever's buying yeah whoever's buying uh one i didn't touch on this you've had multiple restaurants whether it's you know a small town pizza shop mm. to skyline and gold star people reach out and want to help you give back how special has that been seeing yeah. you know them come together and help you yeah it goes back to kind of the whole doordash thing and you know like i mentioned you asked what doordash started from i didn't i didn't really know and maybe this was what god had kind of planned to kind of take me down this route to where i was able to give back in in a charitable fashion which is something i had enjoyed in the past and you know, making videos, I, I think the, you know, the restaurants um, saw the videos and were touched by them and, yeah. and wanted to be a part of it. Cause this, in a way it's, you know, I, I say I came from a small town, Lawrenceburg, everybody knows each other, but I don't wait. Sometimes Cincinnati feels that way as well. I mean, yeah. it really does feel like a community and, and the experiences that I've had the last couple months, um, I feel the love that, you know, the businesses and just the community as a whole has for each other. And they're wanting to help out in any way possible. And they'd use me as kind of an avenue to do that. So they'll just hit me up. And it's gotten to the point where um, I was using my DoorDash money that I was making to go out and buy meals. And now they're just sending me meals for free. Just a bunch of different it's, it, skyline itself, you know, big chains up to that or down to like a local mom and pop shop. Yeah. Um, just making a couple extra meals at the end of their shift to be able to give to me to hand out around town. So it's been it's been really special to see that um, in coming from the small town community and, and still feeling that in a bigger city setting. So 
Yeah, it's awesome, and it's so cool to watch. Um, you didn't bring me food, though, when you showed up today. I guess I, I had to order. You could have so. ordered. I was ready. I was that, on the app. Yeah, and you were. it would have been great. It would have been perfect. <laughs> um, last thing I'll ask you, uh, what advice would you give to you know, a, a high school punter that, that wants to follow your footsteps and is dreaming of getting to where you're at, or even a kid that's you know maybe, a, 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 I almost said rookie, a freshman in college, get, just getting his, his – I was going to say feed his foot wet. Um, <laughs> but what advice would you give a young, a young kicker or a specialist? Um, if you're wanting to be a kicker or a specialist, don't just specialize in it. I know it might, may sound weird, but I feel like going through this process and understanding the kicking game, I feel like a lot of kids will just kind of hone in and try to just be a punter or try yeah. to be a kicker or long snapper growing up. Um, but I wouldn't have got to this level if I hadn't played other positions or other sports as well. I mean, I played everything I could growing up, yeah. basketball, baseball, soccer, track and field. And like I said, I was, I was wanting to be a quarterback. The best specialists today, especially at this level, they're athletes. Yep. I mean, you got to be able to go out there and, and catch an errant snap or if something happens, have the athletic ability to be able to, you know, adjust mid rep, or if, you know, you, you drop the ball wrong, be able to adjust your swing and, doesn't necessarily happen if that's all that you do. You know, you've got to yeah. have an athletic background. So I, I biggest thing I tell young kickers or, or punters or anybody who wants to be in the specialist field is play other sports. You know, go out and try everything. And that's going to make you a better punter or kicker more than going out and kicking an extra 100 balls a day or something. Yeah. Having an athletic background, that's what coaches want to see. They don't want to just see you, the dorky kicker that, you know, falls apart in any kind of pressure moment. You got to have the other experiences from playing um, other sports or positions, and and that worked out for me. So yeah, well, and I got to figure out how we can cross the path of you. Like, have you ever kicked a DoorDash order to somebody? <laughs> Not yet. You've had to think about that. I right? mean, I've got a five star rating. That might hurt the rating a little <laughs> bit, but it would be a great video. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll figure that one out. Drew, thanks so much, man. Appreciate you coming. No, thanks on. for having on. Yeah, this was awesome, and we'll see everybody right back here next week on the Mental Game. And that was a fun conversation with Drew. And you heard us mention a couple times our high school, LaSalle High School. We both punted for the Lancers. Obviously, Drew was a little bit better than me playing at Ohio State and in the NFL. But as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm rocking this new LaSalle shirt. I stopped by my alma mater this past week on the Mental Game Pep Talk Tour. They gave me a shirt, so I had to wear it for this episode. But once again, big thanks to Drew for coming on the podcast and also all the great work he does giving back to the community through DoorDash. Next week, it is another surprise guest on the Mental Game. Your one hint, it is another musician. That's your one hint, another musician, and we'll see everybody right back here next week on the Mental Game. Thank <laughs> you.